Um, one of my favorite books, I wrote this in uh, the letter to you all. One of my favorite books, it's called The Power of Moments. It's by um, Chip Heath. It's a really good book. Um, it's all about how moments define our lives. You know, if you, if you think about it, you look back on your life, what do you, what do you remember? You, you often remember the moments, right? It's really the moments that you remember. In the book, he says, our lives are measured in moments and defining moments are the ones that endure in our memories. You know, and we all have those defining moments in our lives, right? Graduations, weddings, child being born, a promotion, you know, whatever they are, we look back on those things as our defining moments. And if you follow Jesus for some time, you probably have those defining moments in your spiritual journeys. I mean, can, can you think of some of those, right? I, I can think of some of those. When I was a younger teenager, I was probably maybe 14 years old. I went with my dad and a group of men from our church to a uh, Promise Keepers conference. It was a men's conference. And it, it was in Cleveland, Ohio, actually. Boo, Cleveland, like, ew, Cleveland. But um, <laughs> it's a nasty city out there, really it is. Uh, sorry if you're from Cleveland, you're never coming back again. But anyway, um, I was there with thousands of other men. It was amazing. And really, it was the first time I ever experienced worship, I think. You know, I was, I was 14 years old. And, you know, it was the first time I ever was like, oh, I get it. This is what it is. I can still remember them playing before the throne of God above. I just remember that moment. Um, Recently, I visited Geneva College, my college, and I went back into this old rundown gym, and I was just looking around and remembering, and, and you know, when I was a freshman in college, I just can't even, I can't even describe it, but there was this moment of just complete surrender in that gym, I remember it. Um, a few years ago, we were um, at, Ken, uh, at Kenya, we went to Kenya on a missions trip, and during the same time, you might, have, you might know this song, the song So Will I by Hillsong came out. And Gwen will tell you it's one of hers too. The song came out and we're just looking over the African plains and we're listening to this song. It says, if the stars are made to worship, so will I. If the mountains bow in reverence, so will I. If the oceans roar your greatness, so will I. For if everything exists to lift you high, so will I. If the wind goes where you send it, so will I. If the rocks cry out in silence, so will I. If the sum of all our praises still falls shy, then we'll sing again a hundred billion times. And we're just listening to the song, looking out at the African plains, and it was just, it was that moment. It was that moment. I actually remember Denise say, you know, about moments, those moments where you feel you can just reach out and touch him because he's so close. He's right there. Um, and last week, if you were here, can we give glory to God for that one more time? I th that really, it was a defining moment in my life. I think it was a defining moment in, um, in, in our church. It was just one of those moments. So I was thinking this week about what to preach. Like, you know, you, you come off of something like that. It's like, what do I say? But if you've caught, about how, you caught on about how I preach, I don't really overcomplicate it. Like last week was 2 Corinthians 3. This week, I'm gonna preach on 2 Corinthians Four, you got it, right? So like, I just kind of go on. And um, I, so I just open up my Bible. I'm like, all right, um, I know what's in chapter four generally, but like, how does it start? What's the deal? So I open it up and verse one says this. It says, therefore, what a cool word, therefore. It's almost like God was saying, okay, so you had this moment, now, therefore, therefore. Having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. So last week, the message was all about beholding the glory of God. And that's what we did, right? We just beheld his glory. We just beheld him. And now this week, we get to the therefore. Therefore, we behold the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose hope. If you look at the original language, it's probably better translation to say, therefore, we are not giving up. So after beholding the glory of God, therefore, we are not giving up. So the title of the message today is, I'm not giving up. So turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 
four. <laughs> this is part four of our series, The Promise Still Stands, Letters to the Corinthians. I'm not giving up. I saw this story, and I think it really illustrates what Paul means by I'm not giving up. Listen to this. This is a good one. One day, a farmer's donkey fell into a well. The animal cried piteously for hours as the farmer tried to figure out what to do. Finally, this is terrible. He decided the animal was old and the well needed to be covered up anyway, so it just wasn't worth it to retrieve the donkey. He invited all his neighbors to come over and help him. So this is not a PETA-friendly story. You know, they're going to get upset at me for this story. Um, yeah, but it's just a story. It's an illustration. Don't get upset, okay? So all these neighbors, they all grabbed the shovel and began to shovel dirt into the well. Yes, they're burying the donkey alive, okay? At first, the donkey realized what was happening, and he cried horribly. Then to everyone's amazement, he quieted down. A few shovel loads later, the farmer finally looked down the well and was astonished at what he saw. With every shovel of dirt that fell on his back, the donkey was doing something amazing. He would shake it off and take a step up. As the farmer's neighbors continued to shovel dirt on top of the animal, he would shake it off and take a step up. Pretty soon, everyone was amazed as the donkey stepped out over the edge of the well and trotted off. That's why you don't give up. No matter who's throwing dirt down on you in the well, don't give up. Don't give up. I'm sure that Paul felt that way, with, especially with the Corinthian church and in his ministry. I mean, talk about some guy who just felt like people were just constantly throwing dirt on him, you know. But he's like, you know what? We do not lose heart. We're not giving up. Turn to somebody and tell them, I'm not giving up. I'm not giving up. I'm not giving up. When the Eagles are behind by 30 points today, I'm not giving. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> boy, boy. Uh, but, um, you know, that, that's really the spirit of what Paul's saying here. I'm not giving up. And as we saw last week, he lived his life in the beholding of the glory of God. And when you do that, your response becomes, I'm not giving up. I'm not giving up. Now I'm going to show you why we're not going to give up. Look at verse 7. You probably heard this verse before. But we have this treasure, this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. You've seen this verse before. Have you ever asked yourselves, though, what is this treasure? We have this treasure? What is it? What's the treasure? Well, Paul answers that question in verse six. So go back a verse. He says, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. What is the treasure that we have? One commentator put it this way, to grasp the gospel and personally come to know the God of glory, to have one's blinded mind cleared, to understand, and one's veiled heart uncovered, is of inestimable value. Don't forget the treasure that you have to even be able to behold the glory of God. Remember, it's veiled. It's veiled, and only if God removes the veil can you behold the glory of God. And if you can behold it, it's a treasure of a measurable value. And that's what we have. We have this treasure in jars of clay. You see what it's saying? God has put a treasure of a measurable value, the knowledge of the glory of God. He put this treasure of a measurable value in you, in you. In an ordinary, cracked, Amen. crumbling, Amen. earthly vessel. That's what you are. You are the jars of clay. That's who we are. He put it in jars of clay. So I, I really want you to get this. God put the treasure of the knowledge of the glory of God in you. A cheap clay pot. Amen. Your cheap clay pot. And that's how powerful God is. 
That's how powerful he is. He puts something so great and glorious in something so ordinary, like a jar of clay. But the power and the glory and the majesty of God is so glorious that it can even shine through such an ordinary jar of clay like you. Amen. And even in your weakness, jars of clay, it's, it's not Kevlar, it's not super alloy, it's not jars of steel, right? Even in your weakness, even in your cracks, even when you're crumbling, even when you're worn down, even in your weakness, God's glory shines through you. That's how glorious God is. That's how mighty he is. Why? Because God's power is made perfect where? In weakness, in jars of clay. The power of God is so strong that it can shine through and even use, even use something so weak as us to accomplish his purpose. The power of God is most conspicuous. It's most evident when it performs mighty works by using vile and lowly things, jars of clay. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way because we're jars of clay, right? But not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. I said this before, but it's important for you to understand you're a jar of clay and jars of clay crack. They get beat up and they're battered. They're fragile. But if God puts something in you, a treasure of immeasurable value, if God put that in you, yeah, your jar of clay self might get beat up a little bit, battered and worn down, afflicted, perplexed, persecuted, and struck down, but not crushed, Amen. but not driven to despair, but not forsaken, but not Destroy because you've got the treasure of the knowledge of God inside of you. But not. But not. That's the power of God. But not. He can sustain and deliver and preserve clay pots like us. We're fragile. We're weak. But when we're weak, he is strong. With, with such a, with su think about it, with such a precious treasure in such fragile containers. Our containers are gonna get cracked and beat up, battered and worn down, but not crushed, not driven to despair, not forsaken, not destroyed. So whatever you're going through today, if you're feeling all of those words, the word for you is, but not, but not. That's the power of God. I, I don't... I, <laughs> I don't think we realize that, I don't think you realize that you should be crushed. You should be driven to despair. You should be forsaken and destroyed. That's what you should be. You're a jar of clay, easily cracked and destroyed, but not. That's the power of God towards you. Nothing else but not. That's God. That's God. If you have breath in your lungs today, Amen. but not, it's because of God. He is the one sustaining you. Why do we think that we're sustaining ourselves? Amen. It's only by the grace of God every single day that your clay pot self is still breathing. That's it. But not. But not. Now, I wish that I could get up here and tell you that there's no afflicted or perplexed, persecuted, and struck down. There's none of that. You don't have to go through any of that. But think about the songs we just sang. That's not correct. Life is hard. There are those things. I, but I wish we didn't have to go through any of that stuff, but, but we do, right? You, you have. You, maybe you are. You will. But here's the thing if you think about it. Can you really know the power of God without going through those things? You can. 
you can't really know about the but not without knowing what it means to be afflicted, perplexed, persecuted, and struck down. Without those things, the but not makes no sense. Look at what Paul says in Philippians 3.10. He actually says, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. And then he says, I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death. Now, you know, raise your hand if you want the first sentence. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. Hey, Amen, hallelujah, yes, I want to know, I want to know. You can't know without the second sentence. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death. You can't experience resurrection power without also experiencing suffering. The two go hand in hand. Listen to this. It is through the participation in the sufferings of Christ that the power of Christ's resurrection is manifested in the life of the Christian. You can't know the power of the but not without experiencing the suffering of being crushed, perplexed, struck down, and destroyed. For there, for there to be the but not of an empty tomb... That would be a cool shirt. We're, we're designing shirts right now, you know, empty tomb, which is butt knot over it. I should trademark, trademark that so I get the royalties. Um, anyway, but like, think about it, but not, but not, for the but not of an empty tomb, there had to be a cross. Amen. Empty tomb doesn't mean anything without Amen. the crucifixion of Jesus. Amen. There has to be both. There has to be both. Look at um, verse 11. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. Point is this, you're a jar of clay. And being a jar of clay isn't easy. Being afflicted, perplexed, persecuted, and struck down is tough. But because of that suffering, you can still praise him. And you can praise him in a way maybe you've never praised him before. Because now you know the power of the but not. But not. You can only praise him for the but not if you've been through it. Right? That's why we can count the joy come every battle. Because we know that's where he is. That's where he is. So death is at work in us but life in you. Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and so we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, man, it is all for your sake, that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. Paul tells us here, now, we don't just suffer for the sake of suffering, though, okay? We don't just suffer for the sake of suffering. There's, there's a purpose in it. It's through suffering. Suffering is the avenue Amen. through which the treasure of the knowledge of God is spread. Amen. You can't spread the treasure without suffering, Amen. just like you can't experience resurrection power without it. It's the very way, it's the avenue through which the gospel message is transported and shown to the world. Think about it. Without the sacrifice and suffering of Paul, would there be a Corinthian church? No. No, it was through his own suffering, through his own sacrifice that the Corinthian church was born. That's what he's writing in these verses. Now, I promise I won't get on P.T.'s soapbox for too long. We will have a side set, like P.T.'s soapbox, and I'll go over here and sit down for a while and just vent for you. But, but listen, here you go. Ready? Passages like this, right here that I just read, these few verses, they remind me of, man, I think we're getting the whole church thing really wrong. Here's what I mean. You are not called to be a consumer of the church. You're not. You're called to suffer for it. Mm, that's what Paul said. You're not called. It's not, it's not I'm here, serve me. It's I'm here, how am I going to suffer for this? 
That's the heart of Paul. Look at what he said in Colossians chapter one. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body that is the church. The church culture today, it needs a reorientation. Well, why not start at Reach Church? Let's start here. We can only control what is in here. What if, what if we all today started asking the question, when we look at the church, when we start, the first question on our mind and in our hearts comes, how am I going to suffer for it? How am I going to sacrifice for it? How am I going to lay myself down so that the gospel can advance? That's what Paul's saying. That's what this is. If if we want to see grace extend to more and more people, that it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God, it will only do that through our suffering and sacrifice. That's the only way. How am I going to suffer for it? This, it just doesn't happen. God call you to do it. You know, I just want to pray for that person, or I pray that the church is going to grow, or I pray that you know, we're going to increase our giving, or we're going to pray, we're going to pray that we do that. Hey, Amen. hear the answer to your own prayer. Amen. You can't have those things without us doing it. Somebody got to do it. Amen. And you know who it is? You. <laughs> you. God, I pray for revival in our area. It's you. <laughs> That's me. That's how it happens. And it doesn't happen without sacrifice. That's the reminder Paul gives us here. And that, 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 that sentiment should be at the heart of the church. Instead of, you know, remember those old UPS commercials? Remember those? What can Brown do for you? You remember that? No? Okay. I don't know. Whatever. They used that. Thank you, Simbao. They, they had these ad, this ad campaigns. It was like, what can Brown, what can UPS do for you? And a lot of times I think we go into the church and say, what can church do for me? <laughs> No, that's nowhere in script. That's not here. It's what can I do for you, Jesus? How can I suffer for the church so that grace extends to more and more people for the glory of God? It's not really PT soapbox. It's just what Paul says, okay? Anyway, let's look at verse 16 now. So, so after all of that, we do not lose heart. We're not giving up. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. So verse 16, it repeats what he says in verse 1. It's the same thing, right? We do not lose heart. We are not giving up. And it's really just a summary of everything that he just said. We're afflicted in every way, but not. So we're not giving up. We're not giving up. We're carrying, always carrying in the body of the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our bodies. So (laughs) we're not giving up. It's all for your sake so that the grace extends to more and more people. It may increase thanksgiving. So we're not giving up. We're not giving up. Though our outer self is wasting away, though we're jars of clay, our inner self is being renewed day by day. And I'm going to show you why you're really not going to give up. When you hear the word renewed, I think we tend to think of like a, uh, a refreshing or being repaired you know, like, like a spa day. That's how we're renewed, like go and get pampered a little bit and feel a little better so you can keep going, you know. Our inner self, that is, we think maybe that's what this verse is saying, that, you know, we're getting beat up on the outside, but, you know, on the inside, God's getting us through it. He's, he's fixing it and repairing us and giving us strength and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, I'm not giving up because I'm going to get beat up, but God's going to get me through it because my inner self is being refreshed. And, you know, I'm getting beat up on the outside, but my inner self is getting a mani petty, and okay, I'm going to be all right, you know. But it's actually way better than that. Way better than that. God is not just refreshing you. He's not just repairing you. 
He's not just gonna make you feel better. He's not gonna just give you a pep in your step to keep going. Listen to me. He is making you into something brand new altogether. Wow. Not just fixing you up. <laughs> making you new. The renewal that's happening inside of you isn't something that God's doing to get you through what you're going through. It's way better. Look, look, at, look at chapter three, verse 18. We looked at it last week. Look at it again. And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of God, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. Yeah, our outer self is wasting away. We're jars of clay. But our inner self, it's being renewed. It's being transformed day by day. What does this mean? Listen, in our, in our inner self, in our, in our deep inner self, there is an ever-increasing intensity of the glory of God. That's what chapter 3, verse 18 said. From one degree of glory to another. One degree of glory to another. That is happening in your inner self right now. And it's happening so much so that you are being renewed into something else entirely. You're being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. What's the image? What are you being transformed into? Look at Romans 8, 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. You're being transformed into Jesus himself. You are being transformed into the image of his son. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being conformed to the image of his son day by day. Nothing but Jesus. God is doing something in your life that goes way beyond just getting you through things. Way beyond it. Whatever you're facing, he's doing more than just getting you through. You know what he's doing? He's preparing you for eternity by transforming you into the image of his son. Listen to this illustration. It says, consider the Australian cicada, a large flying insect which makes its annual noisy appearance in midsummer. During its life cycle, there is an outer husk the exoskeleton which lies underground and within which the cicada is formed over many years. At the right time, the exoskeleton, the outer self, reaches its end and the beautiful insect flies away in freedom. The outer frame existed for the formation of which that was its true purpose. The new life which would issue from it. This life with its troubles, it's a preparation for our true destiny and eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Amen. Amen. That's what it is. That's what it is. That is what God is doing in your inner self. He's not just getting you through life. He's preparing you for eternity. And so when you read verse 17, look, for this light momentary affliction, it's, what, it's preparing for us. An eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Now, when Paul says this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory, he's not saying that afflictions are good in and of themselves, right? The, the, the message isn't, you know, go and seek out afflictions so you can prepare for eternity. No, I don't want you to do that, okay? That's not what he's saying. But our sufferings and our afflictions, whenever they may come, whatever battle that you may face, you wanna know how they are preparing for you? That they're preparing an eternal weight of glory because they will shift your eyes off the seen to the unseen. Because what's seen is transient. It's all fading away. But what is unseen is eternal. It's eternal. And when you, shift, when you start to shift your eyes more and more off the seen to the unseen, you realize 
that the pain of whatever temporal sufferings and afflictions you're facing or will face, it's so light in the face of eternity and what God is preparing for you. And he's preparing for you right now. Right now, he is preparing you. Right now in the unseen, in that inner self, he is preparing you for eternity by transforming you into the very image of his son day by day. And when you have that perspective in your life, you see what happens when you do face those light and momentary afflictions? You realize that even though you're facing them, God is preparing something in you that is so much greater than anything that you could ever face. That's what he says in chapter five. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on, we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God who has given us the spirit as a guarantee. So we are always, always, always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord for we walk by faith, not by sight. I don't walk by sight. I don't walk by what I'm going through. I'm walking by faith and I know that he is renewing me every day in the deep inner recesses of my soul. He's changing me and he's preparing for me something greater than I could ever imagine. So whatever I face, oh, it's so light. It's so momentary compared with the weight of glory. He is right now preparing and transforming you for. Hallelujah. He's preparing you for eternity by transforming you into the image of his son. Look at 1 John chapter 3. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. You can't see it. It's unseen. But we know, I know, I know, I know that when he appears, we shall be like him. We shall be like him. Because then the unseen becomes the seen. We shall see him as he is. We shall see him as he is. That's why church, I'm not giving up. I'm not giving up, ever giving up. No matter the dirt that's thrown down in my well through other people, through afflictions, through things I didn't plan on, through whatever attack the enemy wants to throw our way, I'm not giving up, we're not giving up. He's preparing right now for you an an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. So fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned and the flame shall not consume you. Even in the fire, and maybe especially in the fire. He is preparing for you an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. And you know what today? You have this treasure in jars of clay to show the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. For we are afflicted in every way but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. Because he is preparing for you an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. 
Are you thankful today that we can shift our eyes off of the seen to the unseen and rejoice that even when you can't see it, he's working to know that he is right now transforming you, conforming you into the image of his son, so much so that when eternity arrives on your door, you will be like him in glory. So let's stand up and let's praise him for being in the fire with us. And let's remember today that no matter what you're going through, no matter what battles you're facing, there is no other name but the name of Jesus. He who was and who is and will be through it all. So come what may, I know, I know. Come on, I know, I know I will never, ever, ever be alone. So I'm not giving up ever. Let's praise him.